Good evening and welcome to episode six of the Islanders We're Live on the Thames Festival Trust Facebook page, YouTube and website. This is Tati, our very last online history event for this project. So before we kick off, just in case, as always, um, we go too long and I have to write wrap up things very quickly at the end of the show. Uh, I would like to say a big thank you to the Thames Festival Trust uh, for bringing me on board for this project, to James King, uh, Adrian Evans. Of course, thank you very much to all of the speakers who have taken part uh, in this six episodes, and to all of you who have been watching and participating with your comments and your questions, because this was always supposed to be an interactive experiment and we made it happen because of all of you. Uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you. I think none of our videos has had less than three to 4,000 views and we learned as much from all of the speakers we had on every panel you know, as we learned from all of you who sent memories, questions, comments, and it's been a pleasure to share this journey with all of you. So thank you very, very much. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about the floods of the 1950s with a focus on the Great Flood of 1953 in East London, North Woolwich and Silvertown in particular, but also about the lessons that we learned as a society and a community from, uh, from those episodes and the big legacy of those episodes, in particular, uh, the Thames Barrier, one of the wonders of the world and i'm sure alan will agree with me uh with us tonight we welcome back historian and journalist colin granger whose marvelous article that he wrote about the floods has a name that tells the whole story colin granger is the author of how the floods of the 1950s shaped our past and present which was first published if I remember well, as part of the Forgotten Stories collection. Uh, Colin, because you and I are such good friends, which I'm very, very, very grateful for, I could be here talking about you and uh, singing your praises for hours. So what about I put you on the spot <laughs> and I let you introduce yourself to the audience. Yes, I'm uh, Colin Granger. As Marius has said, I was the uh, former editor of the New York Recorder. Worked there for 40 years, and uh, after a few years after that at the Guardian, I um, carried on my passion of history and heritage, and uh, got involved in a number of things, including with Marietta at the Royal Docks History Club, and uh, with the late Kevin Jenkins and myself started the Heritage New York Group, and um, we've seen quite a massive growth, as Marietta knows, of um, local Facebook groups that uh, love to sharing memories. So it's my pleasure to talk about anything history related. And obviously, as you said, I think earlier on at the head of the show, the Big Thames Festival Trust is the latest thing. The island has been a fantastic success and uh, got lots of people involved with a you know, passion for history and heritage again. So that's all good in my book. <laughs> anyway, enough of me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And to talk about the Thames barrier, we are delighted to welcome tonight Alan Atkin Park from the UK Environment Agency at the Thames barrier. Alan has become very, very, very popular, uh, I would say because of the wonderful job that he does also on Twitter, where he puts out a lot of very educational and interesting uh, information and content about the Thames barrier. I'm going to show you a couple of examples. I hope Alan doesn't mind. So if you're not following Alan yet, I would really recommend you to do it because that's the kind of content and interesting information about the Thames barrier that you will get to see if you follow Alan on Twitter and Alan because of all the content that I have been stalking and, and, and following and, and watching on your account I have a I think I got an idea of what you do at the Thames Barrett but ask Colin I will let you introduce yourself to the audience. Yeah hi so my name's Alan I'm one of the five uh, flood forecasters that are based at the barrier 24 7 365 so we're one of the ones even during the pandemic we've been permanently manned at the barrier 
just in case there's any severe weather that's coming our way that would cause a tidal surge that would funnel up the River Thames, we would then alert to our uh, closure team to close the barrier and or issue flood alerts as necessary if it's only going to be low level flooding to some of the riverside communities. Thank you very much, Alan. And the other protagonist of tonight, <coughs> as always, is all of you. So please, if you're watching this live, and even if you don't watch it live, because this video is going to stay on the Facebook page and the YouTube channel and the website of the Thames Barrier. So even if you're not watching live, but especially if you're watching live, uh, do leave a comment with your question uh, or to share a memory. Perhaps you were already born by the 1953 floods. Perhaps you were in the area in the 80s when the Thames Barrier opened and you have very um, good memories, clear memories of the inauguration. Perhaps you heard the stories of the floods in the 50s from your parents or grandparents, or perhaps you just have a question for either Colin or Alan. So if you are watching live, and if even if you're not watching live, please do leave a comment. If you do it live, I promise I will read all of your comments and questions before the end of the show. Uh, now, the first thing we're going to do today is to put things into context. Because the Great Flood of 1953 was not something that affected just East London, very, very far from it. So the 1953 North Sea Flood was a big flood caused by a heavy storm at the end of Saturday 31st of January 1953 and the morning of the next day the storm surge struck the Netherlands, northwest of Belgium, England and Scotland. A combination of a high spring tide and a severe European windstorm over the North Sea caused the storm tide. The combination of wind, high tide, and low pressure caused the sea to flood land up to 5.6 meters that is 18.4 feet above uh, the sea level over 1800 people died in the netherlands in england 307 people were killed in the counties of lincolnshire norfolk suffolk and Essex. 28 people were killed in the north of West Flanders in Belgium and 19 people were killed in eastern Scotland. More than 230 deaths uh, took place on sea craft along the northern European coast as well as on ships in deep water of the North Sea. The ferry MV Princess Victoria sank in the North Channel, east of Belfast, with 133 fatalities. We can't, that's actually a real photo of the uh, ferry the day after or during the episode of um, when it sank uh, from the Belfast Telegraph newspaper. And uh, 133, 133 people died in uh, this incident, but also many, many fishing trawlers sank. Now, moving to how the Great Flood of 1953 affected East London and North Woolwich and Silvertown. One thing that we need to remember is that most of the area that now is the Royal Docks, Canning Town, Custom House, North Woolwich, Silvertown, uh, that is built in an area that was mostly marshland so very wet already anyway. And I have a couple of pictures to prove that. So if you can see at the bottom of this map, as I was saying, all of the area that is now the Royal Dogs was just marshland. So already very, very wet. All from what it says, Abbey Marsh, which would be some, some, somewhere between Canning Town and the limit with Canary Wharf south of Plasto, all of the area that you know set where it says Plasto level that would be marshland in the area that is now Silvertown and and then all going to North Woolwich and nearly Beckton all of that was marshland and we also have this picture of 1904 again you can see it's all marshland all the way 
from the area that we now know as Royal Docks to Beckton. <coughs> And that's how we get to the main theme of today, which is uh, the floods in the Royal Docks. And to properly tell the story, uh, better Colin Granger than me. Uh, so, Colin, before we look at how <laughs> they affected the Royal Docks in particular, let's recap how these those events unfold in Europe and in Britain. Um, the Great Flood, as I think it became dubbed and it's universally known as, um, as you kind of already indicated, began as a sort of a low pressure out in the mid-Atlantic and uh, it sort of whirled round between Britain and Iceland um, until it got to Hurricane Falls on January the 31st and then it moved to the middle of the North Sea and then I think the following day the spring of high tide eventually started to affect us and hit Essex and Ken in the middle of the night. Um, Harwich was first hit and then Jaywick um, and the storms literally threw caravans and chalets around like toys that was a frequently used phrase at the time and it tends to get used with there's hurricanes and, and that around the world now still um the, the sea rose i think i've just made about three foot in 15 minutes uh, and 35 people were killed there sadly and then the tidal surge literally came up the thames and the, the sea levels were higher it came by about 10 foot higher but the 10 foot above normal in, in fact uh, when when did the local people when did the when did the local communities in Royal Docks first get the warning of what was about to come? Um, I think uh, so. Sorry again, I just have to refer to my notes on this because it's going to be exact. It was about eleven forty on January the thirty first, and it was the mainly the area around Bow Creek, um, the tidal outflow of the River Lee. Um, so the areas we suffered um, were. Custom House, Canning Town, North Woolwich, Silvertown. Um, South End Police, I believe, uh, were the first to uh, contact New Scotland Yard uh, that the water was 20 foot above the higher watermark and rising fast. And that message was sent to all waterside divisions. And the picture you've got on screen at the moment um, are the watchers that were sent to waterside uh, divisions, uh, seven selected points by the River Thames and K Division, which was what's, which is the, the local police area is still known, K District, I think it's called now, um, was stationed at North Woolwich, and the danger mark was Woolwich Ferry Pier. Um, uh, just before midnight, Fire Brigade Control at West Ham were informed that the tide at West Ham still had two and a half hours to flow, and just before 2 a.m., uh, the water started coming into Silvertown from the docks, so that's that's kind of how it, 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 it happened. Um, but, and at Silvertown at Fire Station, that was being evacuated and the tide reached its peak was at Bow Creek outfall. And uh, just a minute later, um, the firefighters got their first call to Dock Road where uh, a night watchman had climbed onto the, um, I think it was on top of the, in, inside his, sorry, onto the roof of his caravan. And um, the first two people to be to be rescued were actually hiding in the roof of their lorry, not on it, as some people think. Um, so they actually used, as you would guess, a hundred foot turntable ladder to lower crews down on a sling to carry out the rescue. And um, the night went on in the similar, similar picture. The first of all, the the thing that hampered them quite a lot was that the Albert Dock telephone exchange was knocked out, and uh, so the fire brigade had no no way of talking in the normal way so I had to use emergency crews or emergency radios and uh, Vincent Street and Mary Street in uh, Canning Town um, were filled with icy water as it would obviously be and um, there's a famous description of St Luke's Church um, which is like a castle on a moat <laughs> <laughs> um, which kind of took me the, 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 the thing you said earlier about it being marshland um, but sewers were blocked, and debris was pumping everywhere, and uh, pumping st sorry, pumping stations also failed. Um, the dock cut was overflowing, and canoes were brought in from Barking Park, which I remember seeing them as kids actually. 
Um, because this all happened a year before I was born, don't forget. So, um, <laughs> I, I, I know you're not that old. Um, Colin, a question for <laughs> yourself. <laughs> a question for yourself oh. and for everybody who is watching. Uh, I've got this photo up. Uh, hopefully all of you can see, which is Albert Road in North Village. Um, I have found, or I have been sent this photo from two different sources. Um, this photo oh, no, yeah. originally originally <laughs> belongs to the uh, new um, archives. Uh, the wonderful Stan Dyson, uh, who is a treasure for the community, who wrote uh, memoir books. He used a lot of photos from the new um, archives in his books, and he has also been kindly sharing those photos. But uh, mm. I have sent it. I have been, I have I have it from both Stan, who used it for his book, and from the archives. And I have two different dates. Uh, uh, yeah. I have I have seen it dated as Albert Road in the 1948 floods, and I have also seen it dated as Albert Road in the 1953 floods. So, my question, either for you or for anybody watching, perhaps because of the um, the van, the the buildings, the bars, you can recognize. Uh, do you know whether this is 1948 flood or 1953 flood? You, you just you just repeated a, a, a debate that I had about I've had about a hundred times <laughs> whether that is 1948 or 1953. Um, as you said, it's been described as both. I think I first posted it as 1953 quite a few years ago on social media, and somebody said no, it's 1948, and then about ten people said no, it's not, it's 1953. <laughs> the picture in the archives, I think, has got 1953 stamped on it. But of course, <laughs> as you know from my old recorder days that um, the, the captions on pictures are only as good as the people who write them on there. <laughs> and so, you know, there's there's loads of other examples where you've where you've got pictures. This is 1976, and it's not. It's 1978. Or um, the short answer is I, I don't know. Um, I mean, it it, it, obviously, it obviously shows quite dramatically how the floods <laughs> went yeah, down our road. Mean, Exactly. Um, I mean, w whether it's a 1948 or 1953 image, it does give us a very good idea of the scenes yeah. in the Royal Dogs when the floods uh, of the 93, which, which, are the, which is the event we are discussing now, that's how the street would have yeah. looked like, whether this photo is actually from the 50s or the 40s. Yeah. In fact, I've got another photo, which this is for sure, unless I have been given the wrong information. This is for sure 1948. Uh, this is just outside Tate and Lyle. It has become one of the most iconic images of the floods. It's, um, it's very romantic in a way. It's, it's a beautiful photo. Uh, and, and again, this is not a 1953 uh, photo, but this again gives us an idea of the scenes and the situations people had to face during the floods. I, 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 I guess you're very familiar with this photo as well, Colin? Yes, yeah, it, 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 as you say, it gets used quite a lot in Tate and Lyle history and um, in, other, in other instances, but it it's just shows the, the level of the water at the time. And, uh, you know, coming back to 1953, the, the, the report in the Stratford Express was the main paper then the recorder didn't start until uh, 68. Um, sort of volunteers, the Salvation Army came in for a lot of praise, obviously, as you'd expect, but um, they reported our volunteers had made rafts out of oil drums and, you know, the householders dropped ropes and so the cups of tea or pots of tea or whatever were, were hauled up and tea and biscuits were hauled up to their, their houses. And, um, you know, pretty, pretty soon we had a, a a major event on our hands and uh, in an echo of wartime um, quite a lot of people came to what wasn't new and then but was still West Ham and East Ham boroughs but it came from Canby Island um, and uh, Canning Town Public Hall was used and uh, about 200 people uh, turned up on the, on the first night of the flood um, in, in, that, in our particular area it's quite amazing really there was only one fatality um, which was in Tidal, Tidal Basin in Canning Town. A guy called Bill Haywood, who was a night watchman at a textile factory, was trapped in the building as the water level rose, and he made it to the top floor where you'd think he was safe, but unfortunately a ga gas pipe burst, and he was overcome by fumes. So, you know, that was very sad. But um, it, it clearly was, you know, a major incident, and um, <laughs> the picture you're showing there obviously is uh, is 
is is the clean up afterwards, which obviously took some time. And this is also um could you could you tell us about how the different institutions um gather resources to help the people who had uh either been left homeless, who had to leave their houses? I mean we are I mean this this photo itself tells a story. Mm. Yeah, it's in a, it's a, in, I think it may even be at, at the place I mentioned at Canning Town uh, in the public hall, which is now occupied by Community Links. Um, and uh, yes, you can see exactly what's happening and uh, everybody pulled together, as tends to happen in these times. Um, Sally Army, um, as I've already said, were, 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 were right at the forefront of things. And um, church pews, I think, were... were were, were used to put, make into beds for night. Um, a lot of people were stuck in their homes overnight and obviously had to stay on the top floor. Um, but, you know, it was the firefighters who did the hard work in, in trying to get rid of the floodwaters, pumping it out. And, um, yeah, it was it was two weeks before a lot of people could actually get back to their homes. So it was a big job for what was then the, the county borough of West Ham. And... Um, they had to start a huge sandbagging operation, and um, in, in typical Cockney humour style, it was dubbed Operation King Canute. So, and um, yeah, they everybody pulled together, and uh, you know, it, 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 but it was a, a big operation. And they got free coal handed out to people um, to start fires to speed up the drying up of the houses. Um, I've got. It's very hard for my dad, as he's now ninety-three, to remember these things. And if I ask him about it, he'll say he doesn't know anything. And then two weeks later, when I talk to him about it, he'll tell me. And uh, he said the RAF supplied um, bomber heating, bomber engine heaters, and um, the Franciscan um, sisters of St Margaret's in Canning Town uh, played a big part in. in in, obviously not only looking after people but starting the big clean up and uh, you know hospitals helped I think by opening their uh, laundries so people could get things dry um, and I guess the same thing would happen now wouldn't it but thank god when we when we talk to the expert later on we'll realise why hopefully we won't have that anymore <laughs> <laughs> so. uh, a last question about the 1953 flood because uh looking at again at this photo of these three ladies cleaning up after the 53 floods in canning town uh in the middle of the chaos a name did go down in local history a name of another female hero uh perhaps not one of these ladies but a lady called mrs annie shepherd of mary street colin yes. what did mary Mary Shepherd, Mary Shepherd from Mary. Annie. Sorry, Annie Shepherd, Annie Shepherd from Mary Street, uh, did the night of the floods. Yeah, she she kind of she was uh, dear Annie. I think she became known. She lived um, in Mary Street, which uh, so my friends grew up in, and my wife grew up in actually. Um, and she lived at number fifty four, and she really stepped into the spotlight. Um, um, <laughs> It only uh, only in her night dress she went all the way down wading through the freezing water to wake all the neighbours in the early hours to tell them what was happening. Um, her daughter who lived a few roads away had, had gone round there to, 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 to warn her, not realising that the, the, where she got to her mum's house was worse because um, it was one of the first streets to be affected and she took her kids there. Um, and before um, Annie could sort of put the fire on, um, the front room, front room was pouring, water was pouring into the front room. So, as I said, she fought her way out, went round all the houses to wake them up to tell people that, you know, that you couldn't escape, you had to get into the top floor. But clearly that made a big difference because who knows, if you're asleep, I don't know, if you'd been out and had a drink the night before and were asleep on the floor or on the settee, who knows what would have happened. So. Um, so she featured um, big time in the paper uh, in the Stratford Express and um, there's a quote from her which says I went through all the air raids in the war but this was worse than any of it there was no simply because there was no warning um, and a neighbor of hers said she's a very brave woman the first thought was for others and if she hadn't roused us many people asleep um, might have drowned in their beds which who knows you know so it was it was about three feet high 
So clear, clearly, what she did was was absolutely fantastic, you know. And uh, you know, fair play to her. Always a woman to solve the crisis, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Colin. Because uh, I didn't know the story of of Annie, and hopefully, when we can resume the normal history club meetings at the North Woolwich um, Learning and Activity Centre in Royal Dose Learning and Activity Centre in North Woolwich and sometimes we do uh, theme talks about uh, women who change our look at history we can include her as well. Mm. Uh, we have already received uh, some comments from the audience and I think perhaps it's a very good moment to have a look at what people are sending us. Uh, Alex says, my mum, James King's nan, so James King is the project coordinator for the Islanders who I mentioned earlier because he um, is partly guilty of me being here tonight, so thank you very much James. Uh, he says, my mum remembers the floods. She lived in Canning Town, right near the docks. She was 12 and remembers waking up and her dad telling her to put her wellies on. The water was about two feet high in the house. She remembers they received new carpet from Canada by a man driving around the street in his van and dumping a roll of carpet on the front garden. <laughs> <laughs> And then Alex says, um, tidal buzzing is where my mom lived. Uh, Alex, that's a really, really interesting, curious story. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. I can see stories and comments also from Angela, from Robert. I'll come back to all of your uh, comments and questions uh, before the end of the show. So do keep uh, sending comments, questions, sharing memories with us. Uh, calling up, uh, perhaps not as famous as the 1953 floods but i think there was also another uh big flood in the 50s 1957 yeah uh it's worth mentioning it wasn't obviously as bad but actually our, our immediate neck of the woods where silvertown and silvertown was um, quite badly affected um and i think um well yes i'm just about to say one of the pictures shows <laughs> could, could you well look up there to see that wasn't it really yeah um <laughs> It, 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 it also, um, you know, lots of locals said Silvertown used to flood regularly. And as you've sh obviously shown pictures from 1948, that kind of backed that up. But um, there were, uh, uh, in the 1957 floods, which, um, yes, I was three then, but I don't really remember it. Um, it, it, it a lot of good humour seemed to come out of that from in people's memories, because I think they'd kind of got used to it. Um, I wanted to mention one in particular, which is a guy called Tom Batterby, who sadly passed away earlier this year. Um, but he said his family got through both floods um, with typical grit. They lived in Westwood Road, Silvertown. Um, he said we, we'd have to, we got used to lifting up the carpets and rolling them up to take them upstairs. My mum had a piano and we used to get flooded and get ready for floods often. Most people didn't have much in those days but we would all share with one another to get through the tough times. Um, a guy called Colin Gascoigne, when I did the original piece, also said, my nan lived in Knights Road, Silvertown, and we, whenever it was coming, my nan and granddad would lift the, or my granddad mainly says, would lift the piano up onto milk crates to stop it getting ruined. And he said, I remember that for years, there was a dirty line around our scullery walls where the floods came up, um, because there were steps going up. Um, and Val Gutteridge, who's uh, very much a North Woolies lady, said her brother um, lived in Canning Town and uh, the area bore a blunt of floods and remembered him carrying his girlfriend piggyback from Canning Town to North Woolwich, wading through the walls because we would be something often remembered in their families. Um, and uh, another quote from Tom that said, West Silvertown used to get flooded regularly up to two feet of water at a time. And uh, they remembered that um, the family uh, had an old tin bath and they used to go to this. He used to paddle in the streets, as you just put another picture up. Well, that's good timing. Um, it's as though we rehearsed it. <laughs> <laughs> didn't actually, but never mind. Um, and they used to paddle in up to the shops and sometimes they would go in the old tin bath, uh, paddling it <laughs> like a boat. You know? So, yeah. Um, other things, I know it's not humorous, but um, there obviously, obviously was in both floods, um, and Stan Cribb from uh, 
Stan Harris from um, Crib Funeral Directs has told me about, you know, he remembers it not for the nicest of reasons because there were lots of rats that came about afterwards <laughs> and uh, they, the, the, the floods brought them brought them out to the tops of the curbs and it made it be said for not a pleasant existence and a lot of the homes had to have rat catchers come down um, because clearly that's what happens it's like when it runs in the garden and uh, my dear little cat brings the mice in um, so yeah it was um, and uh, and two, two final things if you indulge me two things which won't surprise you the Henley Arms even though the Henley Arms pub uh where the cellar was flooded and part of the pub was flooded the regulars carried on drinking not really a surprise but <laughs> uh, and also the keep, keep, keep calm and carry on indeed yes yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, the tate the tate issue was even more uh, surreal if you like like it was actually completely flooded at the bottom but they just simply put the chairs on top of the tables and carried on drinking um, and Keep that's why. Carry on, carry on drinking. Me. Oh, no, yeah, nothing, nothing, nothing should stop you having a drink. <laughs> and Colin, the uh, last question for you before we move to uh, to Alan. The name of the article you wrote is "How the Floods in the 1950s Shaped Our Future." So, what were the consequences, the legacy, the lessons learned in the 1950s, and how did that lead to the constructions of the Thames barrier? Um, I, I th it's pretty straightforward, really. I think um, it finally got uh, the authorities to get their head around the idea that they should do something about it and look at flood defences. Um, a, a government inquiry was set up uh, to include flood protection, and the first plan was to temporarily raise sea walls, which is obviously quite sensible. And a movable barrier um, was erected by the Lee Valley Conservancy Board. Conservancy Board, uh, Lee Tidal Barrier, which was operated, it finally came into operation in the early 80s. But of course, the most magnificent thing, which I sadly keep referring to as the eighth wonder of the world, because I think it is, um, was the Thames Barrier, which you know was 30 years after it actually the, the main floods happened almost. Um, opened in 1984. Um, I'm sure Alan is the expert in this and will tell us how much it cost, but at the time <laughs> I, it was 500 million. Um, and it's it's also got a special significance for me because my, my uncle David Granger was one of those who helped build it and um, sneaked me in when I was a kid to have a look underneath um, the control well, what I think eventually became a control wall. Then it was just blocks of concrete. So, um, But yeah, it was... Um, I, I still regard it as uh, as the most important development that the area has had, you know, for many years. And uh, I think it's just fantastic. And also, it's a fantastic view from the Thames Barrier Park, which, as you know, Marietta has a special meaning for me because that's built on the site of a factory my mum worked in. So there's, there's, there's for me personally, there's, you know, I used to go into that factory quite a lot and it was the most polluted place in the area. And then, you know, they laid did all the decontamination works and then built a fantastic park and we've now got a brilliant view of um you know what's saving us all every day and i don't have it here uploaded but there is actually a beautiful photo of you with the thames barrier behind you which i, I think you use you, you you use very often as one of your profile pictures on your blogs and websites so um i would like to invite you to post the photo of you with the barrier behind later on the comments because as you said it's also a place that has a very you have a very strong connection with the thames barrier so i think more people would like to see the photo of colin ranger uh in front of the thames barrier uh colin uh stay here because we may have some questions or comments from the audience that you might be interested in reading or perhaps you have an answer or uh, or comment back for them uh i'm going to mute you colin yes in the meantime and we're going to move now to um interviewing having a quick chat with alan to properly talk about the thames barrier alan if you could explain with as much detail as possible especially for techie idiots like me who don't understand anything unless it's so well explained as you do it on your tweets um what does the tame barriers do and how does it operate so 
Yeah, um, what does the Thames Barrow do? Well, ultimately, it stops any big tides going into central London. Um, 1953, as Colin said, was a real catalyst. You know, it was a case of enough is enough. That was a real, you know, last chance of saloon for central London. The River Thames on that fateful night was absolutely brimful. And we were fortunate that the defences managed to hold tight. Otherwise, the situation could have been much worse. Um, so, so what it does ultimately is it consists of 10 movable gates, six of which normally rest on the bed of the River Thames and four rest above the surface and simply drop into position. And once we close those 10 gates, um, what we've basically got is a 520 meter wall of steel that tops that stop that incoming tide from coming into London and into West London and uh, potentially causing uh, serious harm. And we've got some photos here. And if you're watching this live, it is absolutely a treasure, a, a, a pleasure and a treasure and an amazing opportunity to have uh, Alan here. So if you do have any question about how the Thames Barrier operates or what does Alan do, or any, are you curious about anything about the Thames Barrier? This is your opportunity to ask these questions. Uh, it's really, 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 really lucky to have Alan here, who, by the way, um, we have to say congratulations because he just became a daddy and he shouldn't be here at all because he should be on, on, on paternal leave and yet he's here talking uh, to us this evening. Alan, for those who might have just joined the show uh, for the second part of the uh, of this event, uh, could you again remind us, explain what do you do in, at the Thames Barrier? Yeah, so I'm one of the five flood forecasters so we each do 12 hour shifts day nights weekends christmas day I've, I've been known to do five christmas days in a row uh, so we're keeping a watch watching the weather systems uh, taking the data from the met office the the surge data and trying to do the forecasting of the river levels between the south end out in the thames estuary and teddington in west london and any particularly harmful tides uh, we will submit our our thoughts to the the management basically. And from that, from using that information, they will say, okay, we need to, to call the team in to close the Thames barrier, or we can issue the flood alerts that you, you might sometimes see in the news that, that this warn the, the people that live alongside the River Thames that it is going to be high and, and might encroach into uh, Riverside Gardens, but ultimately not cause any serious harm to properties. Uh, and you also play a very special role through this Twitter account that you have and you run. You have become like a link between the Thames Barrier and, and the people out there, the audience, the, the residents, people who live in London and people who don't live in London but are, are following the account. And, and you also are like a bit of like a community notice board, notice board alert service because um, besides uh, closing the barrier when there is a risk of flood, I think you also have a scheduled... Um, test uh you close the barrier as a test to make sure everything works and you let people know in advance and that i think and partly thanks to you because you help spread the news that becomes like a big uh, community event like people go to the thames barrier to see how you open it and close it uh when they know it's going to happen because it's a scheduled yeah, so uh, once a month we get the opportunity to have a full closure of the Thames Barrier. We try and do it at low tides, so it's a minimal impact on river traffic. Um, but that gives us opportunity to make sure all of the plant and equipment is still working. And it's also vital for staff training. It's a great opportunity for them uh, because we can test under certain different scenarios. We can, not that things go wrong very often, but we, we can just throw in, you know, what if this doesn't work we then have to switch and do another mode of operation and as you say those those photos there are from one of our annual test closures so once a year we we close as we did yesterday we close at low tide uh, but we leave it shut across the whole of the tidal cycle so we can put the barrier against the maximum possible strain uh, so that can be in excess of four and a half meters the difference in river, river levels between uh, the sort of Silvertown side and the Charlton side, as, as we refer to it. Uh, so it's the maximum possible strain uh, ahead of the winter season. And we can invite members of the public down to that event um, and sort of showcase the work that we do so we, we can get the teams out and, and you know, say it's not just about closing the barrier, but it's all about all of the maintenance work that goes on behind the scenes. And unfortunately, with the way the world is at the moment, we weren't able to do that this year. But um, 
all being well, we hope to put on a bit more of a show so we can, we've got already three dates in mind for next year's event and hopefully we can get our cafe back open and our uh, information centre back open fully rather than it is it currently is on a, on a pre-book basis and, and uh, yeah, we can, we can really show people what we do. How many times a year, more or less, how many times in the recent years has the barrier closed because of real risk of flood, real risk of uh, damage to properties? And, and which special events do you remember? Uh, so the current tally is 199 flood defence closures. So uh, dating back to the first one in February 83, uh, okay. we had six, six closures last winter. Um, so even during the pandemic, when you know social distancing was was a real concern to us, we put in special processes in place that we were still able to to close the barrier as well as keeping London safe, keep our staff safe as well, which is which has been a real mm -hmm. triumph. Um, noticeable events, of course, that the winter of 2013-14, when we had it all started on the is it sixth of December. Mm -hmm. uh, we closed the Thames Barrier that night for the highest tide we've ever protected against. So it was, it was only two or three tides below the, the level that was observed in 1953. It was a, a 4.1 metre tide at South End, which sounds a lot, but we, we've done the calculations. Of, I think we came up with a one in 17 mm -hmm. year event and we protect a one in a thousand. So there was, there, was, uh, there was still room that we could close the barrier safely, that's for sure. Um, but then that, that kicks off the first of 50 closures that year. And wow. I remember I wasn't, at, I wasn't actually one of the forecasters then, but I did 10 night shifts in a row, which, um, yeah, that, that really took its toll after a while. With, uh, with climate change as a threat that we might be facing, uh, floods is uh, one of the biggest concerns. <clears throat> um, have you seen, noticed, have you any data to back that this is happening? Have you uh, noticed or seen any change in how much, how much higher the tides are getting, how much frequent the threats of floods are, uh, are, are occurring? Yeah, it was always expected that the Thames Barrier would close more often. It was always designed that in the 80s it would close maybe once every two years and that would increase through the 90s and into the turn of the millennia. And there's a number of factors associated with that. With that. You've got climate change for one. And when they designed the Thames Barrier, they took uh, a slightly what we call a beer mat estimate of what sea level rise would be. And, and their estimate was between 8 and 10 millimetres a year. Mm -hmm. what, what they're currently seeing is somewhere between two and three millimetres a year. So that does reflect why the Thames Barrier is closing more often, but it also suggests why, although it was originally designed to last until the year 2030, we now think with ongoing maintenance and improvements, the existing Thames Barrier is still going to be useful until 2070. Okay. So as well as climate change, there is also um, a process called isostatic correction. Mm -hmm. And that is associated with the Ice Age, when all the ice built up over Scotland um, for all those thousands and thousands of years. Um, that effectively had a tilting effect. So Scotland started to sink and South East England started to rise up slightly. And that correction is actually still going on. So the South East of England is still slowly sinking. And of course, London is built on clay, the famous London clay. So all of the construction work that goes on in central London is still squeezing and squeezing this London clay. So, you know, that also impacts the fact that London is still slowly sinking into the ground and therefore the barrier would be needed to um, protect London more often. Uh, this might be <clears throat> perhaps a tricky question. Um, I just thought of it um, when you were talking about um, we, we this barrier um, will be OK until 2020. And I was already thinking on what will happen next and what if we didn't have another one up that is that can work and cope with that. Uh, uh, with the situation after that. And I was thinking, um, what would have been the worst scenario? Which, how much damage, uh, what sort of tragedies we would have seen in London if we had not had the Thames barrier in the last years, for example? Yeah, it's a question I get asked a lot. Um, so out of the 199 of the barriers closed, what if we did leave it open? How many properties would flood? Where can I find a map is what I sometimes get asked. And I sometimes say, well, go into the stationers and buy a map because if everything worked, 
nothing would flood at all. It would have been within the existing flood defences, all of the walls, embankments, um, the gates would have been closed. Everything would have been fine. But you know, it's the case of what if something had gone wrong? What if one of the walls had caved in? Um, going back to an example in 1928, which was the last big flood in central London, uh, 14 people lost their lives because part of the river wall around Westminster collapsed and a number of people drowned in their sleep because it went into basement properties and they, and they couldn't escape. Um, and that's why it's not just the Thames Barrier, it's a, it's a whole network of flood defences that stretch from South End and Sheerness in the estuary all the way across to Teddington in, in West London. And it's the whole network that makes sure that uh, London is safe from tidal flooding. And another very stupid question that I just um, I just reminded myself of something because I just I'm not living now in, in <clears throat> North Woolwich, um, but I used to live in North Woolwich and I used to live in North Woolwich by Galleons Ridge. So if this is a Thames, it's very confusing because I, 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 I'm going this way and this screen is going this way. But basically, if this is a Thames, the, the Thames River. I was living here. And the Thames barrier is here, so the Thames barrier is the Thames barrier is protecting to us people who live here. Uh, we have this optical impression that the barrier is protecting from here to here. Sorry, from here to here. <laughs> so uh, all of those all of those riverside communities <clears throat> in London before the Thames barrier is it protecting us or not? The, the barrier obviously won't because it does hold back some water. But what you do have is much higher flood walls and defences and a network of gates that does keep everything within the network. So immediately upstream of the barrier, the flood walls are at 5.18 metres. Immediately the other side, the, the walls are 7.2 metres. And they slowly go down and down and down as you, as you go towards the estuary. So the water is always contained within the network. Um, there are a number of um, Tate and Lyle, for example, the Woolwich Ferry, um, the Ford Motor Works at Dagenham. They also have their own floodgates and they still have okay. access to the river. But when the Thames Barrier closes, we have to ensure that their gates are closed and remain closed until we tell them it's safe to reopen. And we'll have inspectors that will go out and make sure that those gates have been closed as instructed. And if necessary, if they have been left open, we can take enforcement action because not only are they putting themselves at flood risk, but also all of the community around them. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that, that's good to know because um, as somebody who used to live there, I used to look at the barrier, like, sorry, at the barrier, like, yeah, but I'm here, the barrier is there, so <laughs> am I going to get, am I, am I safe? <laughs> um, I've got a bit of, um, let's play like a bit of a quiz. Uh, I've got some screenshots from your tweets, which I, I, I really find fascinating. And this is a quiz and it's called, I'm gonna show the screenshot and you're gonna try to explain to us exactly what we're looking at and what is happening. So um, here, Alan, you have said, here is Charlie also moving up to the underspill position. The shifter arm is in the foreground, in, is in the foreground, is driving the gate upwards. There is a spur on the other side as a backup. Gates can be operated from just one side. The seagulls have waited patiently, patiently for their special lunch. Uh, so um, my first question is, who is Charlie? <laughs> so each of the <laughs> 10 gates have got names. So you've got Alpha is the first one nearest the uh, the South Bank. And then you've got Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo, Foxtrot, Golf. Uh, where are we? Juliet, Kilo. What have I missed out? Lima. No, hang on. Hotel Juliet Kilo. Yeah, that's it. I confused myself there. So 10 gates have all got names and all the peers uh, are numbered one to nine in the opposite direction. Um, a lot going on here. There's always a limit to what you can uh, say on Twitter. You always limit it to <laughs> 280 characters. But what's happening here is um, we've reached high tide. Um, this was at the uh, annual closure yesterday. And what we've done here is, you know, the, the tide is now receding so in a flood defence situation what we'd want to do is get the river back open as, as quickly as possible because obviously it is London's green highway there's a lot of traffic that uses it so we over rotate the gates uh, up to about 118 degrees and that gives us a three foot gap underneath which um, it, it allows a very fast jet of water uh, under it which flushes out a lot of silt and debris and gravel and 
and, uh, and what have you that's built up within the span in fact that does have an effect for, for quite a long way you, you can even go back to uh, up to Murphy's Wharf and they, they can still see the benefit of when we do <laughs> uh, which really helps them out because it means that their their ships can actually dock a lot easier um, <laughs> to move it into the underspill position uh, what you've got in the foreground is that yellow arm um, because the, the sort of the grasshopper legs you've got in the in the uh, the top there, they're the ones that do the opening and closing, um, but they can't push it into the, the sort of over rotation position. So uh, this is the the shifter arm, which under normal conditions acts as a bit of a handbrake. It it locks the gate into certain positions, but in this instance, it can push the gate beyond the closed position. And because of the resilience we've got on the barrier, there's always at least two of everything. So normally we can drive the gate just using the one um, mm -hmm. we've got in the foreground. But if for any reason that wasn't operable, then we've got exactly the same equipment on the other side that can still drive the gate into any position that we need it to. Fantastic. Um, look at this. Uh, the Thames barrier is closed. This is from the 1st of February this year, we are preventing the incoming tide meeting the high river flow coming the other way. The meeting of the two could have flooded properties upriver of Teddington will remain closed until the tide has ebbed and levels either side are equal. So this is a, another, a very good example of cases in which you have closed the barrier to prevent uh, damage, right? Y yes, so in this example, um, I can't remember the exact figures, but I'm, I'm guessing it had been pretty heavy rainfall that had pushed a lot of a lot of river flow down the River Thames through uh, Buckinghamshire, Berkshire, um, and into into West London. Of course, the, the Thames is a massive catchment that spans seven counties. Um, and what you've got is a a bit of a, a coming together of forces. Really, if you can imagine, if I just get myself back into shot. Uh, you've got 500 trucks coming in one direction meeting 500 trucks in another direction they're all going to collide and sort of scrunch up and create a, a huge mound of lorries and, and devastation if you like um, so because seawater is heavier and denser it, it really does back up the, the freshwater flow coming the other way um, so what we were concerned about there is the island communities, um, so Trolock Island, Thames, Ditton Island, um, and, and those immediately upstream of Teddington Weir, which mm -hmm. aren't necessarily part of the tidal Thames, but because of the influence the, the high tide would have had on that particular occasion, it would have stopped that flow from get, taking its natural course into central London uh, and would have flooded those communities as a result of, of being uh, held up. That's fascinating. Um, oh. That's the last one I'm going to show. And you said here that's the 19th of September 2021. We have a 3.2 meter difference in river levels either side of the closed Thames barrier. It can cope with much more, 4.5 meters. So uh, when we're talking about um, river levels, what are we? talking about because I, I think I, I, we can actually see how that the water is higher than the other side uh yeah so this is basically what the, the, the barrier is is designed to do it it's protecting the incoming tide uh on the right hand side flowing into to central london which is uh, on the left hand side as we see this image uh, it's difficult to put put it into scale really i guess if you look at the ladder on the right hand side there and you, you think about how many steps there are there you that's when you get a real sort of feel of of what the, the river level uh, is i mean on a flood defense closure it would normally be a little bit less than that we normally have sort of 2.53 meters difference because we do still let some water in uh, just so we can keep the river open for traffic as as much as possible because you know it is a very busy stretch of river in in charlton um but yeah the the, the barrier can certainly deal with uh, with differences much higher than that um it's it's extraordinary how much pressure those gates can can take and it's one of the reasons why i really liked this uh this photo this tweet that as i was saying you shared with us uh is very educational is very visual is very powerful because uh we can clearly see the the uh difference 
in the level of the water, one side to the other side. And as you said, this is in a nutshell what the Thames Barrier is supposed to be doing to protect riverside communities. Let's have a look now at some of the comments that we have received this evening. Uh, Angela says, apart from the 1953 tidal flood, Silver, Silver, Silver Town and North Woolwich also suffered from flash floods after summer storms when the drains couldn't cope. Uh, Colin, I think this is something you were already um, touching before. Yeah, yeah. And you um, may, you may remember because you, you lived in the area until the 70s? Uh, yeah, into my, into my teens, yeah. And uh, it, 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 it very, I mean, the 1948 picture that we have to query about um, and the comments that uh, I mentioned earlier, people said that uh, it, there often used to be flash floods. I mean, it, we've experienced them, haven't we, in the last couple of years um, over where I am in Romford now. And um, I know people like David, David Conroy, who, who takes lots of pictures in the area. There's often different parts of it just hit by a flash flood and you know we seem to be having a lot of, of a lot of those of late which we, we tend to read quite a lot is um, possibly due to global warming and climate change and what have you. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert Rogers says uh, regarding uh, the photo of the flood <laughs> either yes because we had shown a photo let me see if I can if I can put it again so people know what we're talking there about um one of my colleagues is going to kill me because um he's been reminding me that i should be wearing my lenses and i forget to do it uh watching this you know who you are and i'm very sorry i haven't done it uh so i can't see um let me see if i can there we are uh so robert roger says um regarding the photo either 48 or 1953 so we had this photo that we had been sent from two sources, Stan Dyson, who wrote a book, and he used some photos of the from the Newham archives. <clears throat> and we also had been sent this photo from the Newham archives, and we had two different dates. And we didn't know whether this photo is 1948 floods or 1953 floods. And then Robert Rogers from the Newham History Society says, uh, re regarding the photo of the flood, either 48 or 53, the trolley bus is not up, is not help as the 669 was first trolley bus in service in West Ham and was driving out of the depot in Greengate Street on the 6th of June 1937 by Alder, Alderman Mrs. Daisy Pardon, Mayor of West Ham, and the last trolley bus run and the last trolley bus ran in West Ham in 1960. I have read it very badly because I'm trying not to have my glasses on and I'm not wearing my lenses. But basically, he's saying, uh, very difficult to find out because this trolley bus was in service uh, from 1937 to 1960. So uh, mystery is not solved yet. If any of you know, have a clue <laughs> to whether the photo is 19. 43 uh sorry uh 1948 or 1953 do let us know and and then we'll we'll be able to put an end to a very very long discussion that we are we keep um having on the different facebook groups don't we calling yeah one thing i can correct <laughs> robert on is it's daisy parsons not not pardon <laughs> the mayor I, I, sorry i i should be wearing my lenses i'm really struggling to read <laughs> <laughs> um, Adam says, what about the floods in the 1980s? Um, anything you can tell about the floods in the 80s, Colleen or Alan? Is... I, I, I can't. I'm not sure. Sure. Is there any... Uh, um, any big flood the in the 80s? Does he mean floods? Yeah, flag. <laughs> I guess it, it means flood. flood. <laughs> um, but no, I, I mean, other, it was another flash flood, which is quite likely. But I, there's nothing that automatically springs to mind that we would have been reporting on. Um, unless it is in when we had the hurricane in '87, might have been associated uh, with it. Yeah. Adam, if you're still watching live. Um, Please uh, send a comment so we, if you if you know exactly which year 
uh, it is the flow you, you, you had in mind that you, you had that interest. And, and then, if not today, we can always do some research, come back, and in the comments, uh, because the video will stay on the Facebook page of the, uh, of the Thames Festival uh, Trust page, uh, I'm more than happy if you let us know exactly which year you're interested, either myself or Colin, we can have a look and, either, and always come back and write uh, an answer to your question as a written comment. Uh, Robert has apologized, realized the mistake, sorry, Colin. <laughs> so, because, um, yeah, I think he miswrote it and then I mispronounced. So what is the name of the mayor of West Ham, Colin? If you could quantify for Daisy Parsons. And then he adds, have come through the Thames barrier on board of the Scottish paddle steamer Weatherly at night as she steamed up to Tower Pier and her massive paddle wheels echoing against the sides of the barrier is a fantastic sound. Uh, something that we didn't actually touch before and Robert has reminded me of, Alan, the Thames barrier, the different gates have enough width, enough space between them so that the river is still a maritime river that ships can go up and down, uh, even cruise ships, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So the gap between uh, the piers in the in the central part of the river, the, the biggest gates, the four biggest gates, are sixty one point five meters, which is exactly the same span as the the rising bascules of Tower Bridge. So okay. anything that can come through us can also go through Tower Bridge as well. So yeah, cruise ships, warships. Uh, yeah, we've we've seen it all. <laughs> Fun. It's fascinating. I mean, um, do you agree with people who call it uh, the eighth wonder of the world? Because I have, uh, I have seen people calling it the eighth wonder of the world. Is in London is a Thames barrier. A lot of people do call it that, and that's just a tribute, really, to its design. It was, it was always supposed to be a, a futuristic design in the in the nineteen seventies when it was drawn up, and it's just managed to, you know last the time it's absolutely fantastic colin what are your thoughts about people calling it calling it the eighth wonder of the world well given that we probably use that headline in the recorder about a hundred times in my time <laughs> I would say it's, no i, I agree with that, but it, it the test of time and uh yeah it's it's yeah and, uh, obviously because we have the the, the park on the little side and the barrier center on the other um that's the best of both worlds for me because it's an easy trip to either one and it's you know i took the kids there when they were young when when, they, when it first opened and as you as you said earlier the school parties love it and uh but yeah it's I, I, it's just a fantastic piece of engineering and i wasn't brainwashed by my uncle dave because he was part of it but, <laughs> but uh it's just something that has a you know everybody's taken it to their heart you know i think over the years and uh and and know that it's doing a fantastically important job well I, I i i will continue calling it one of the eighth wonders of the world and what has been wonderful is to learn much more about how it operates how it is keeping communities safe so thank you very much alan for being with us this evening thank you very much colin for sharing all those stories about the floods in the 1950s with us Thanks to all of you. This is the end of our journey this year with the Islanders. It's been a real, real pleasure. I hope you continue sharing this video and you can continue making comments, uh, sharing stories, memories. Uh, so all of those memories can stay part of this video in your comments so all of us can continue learning from each other. History is alive, heritage is alive. You're all keeping it alive. Thank you for being part of the Thames Festival 2021, the Islanders Project.